Hello, everybody, then. Um, it's 5.30, and it's time for the second installment of Work in Progress, uh, Construction History in New York and Chicago. We are back with a new topic, having examined uh, foundations last week, uh, and we're moving our way up the building um, through frames. The next installment or next episode of this uh, continuing symposium and conversation uh, will be in two weeks uh, and, uh, and will focus on facades. Uh, and the last one, especially looking at codes and fire, will complete this suite of conversations um, and presentations by Donald Friedman, um, representing New York, our New York expert, um, and uh, Thomas Leslie, uh, as the um, resident Chicago expert. Uh, I, we are also joined tonight by Brian Bowen, who's going to be the respondent. Um, and I'll give Brian a little bit more of an introduction uh, just before we start the conversation and after the two separate presentations. I will spend just a few minutes talking about a little bit of background history and also uh, the rest of the series and um, a little bit more of an introduction for Tom and Don. So um, let me advance my slides um, in order to uh, show you the page, the overview page from our website uh, that describes the approach uh, and the, some of the background questions uh, as well as the bios of the speakers for um, this series. The series follows um, on uh, an investigation, uh, a survey of questions of early skyscraper history and construction, um, the beginnings of the skyscraper, the late decades of the 19th century were the subject of uh, about uh, a dozen scholars in uh, a semester long symposium that we called Rewriting Skyscraper History. And you can find all of those lectures, including some by um, Don individually and Tom individually, uh, as well as, as uh, in conversation uh, as a kind of predicate for this in-depth series. You can also um, find some of the questions that we explored about the historiography in placing some of the issues that we're airing in these separate episodes um, into a broader context of the historiography of modern architecture, of, um, of um, uh, the history of architecture, of construction technologies and technological um, history. So um, I will, I'm going to so very briefly touch on some of those issues um, as I show you some uh, additional background slides. And once again, I'm using the covers of the notable books by Tom Leslie, um, Chicago Skyscrapers in this period that we're talking about tonight from 1871 um, to 1934 in his periodization. Uh, and Don Friedman's book, which focuses on the early decades of the skyscraper across America, but only until 1900. I um, mean, I did want to mention as a plug for Don's book that um, unfortunately it's kind of hard uh, to, to um, acquire a copy. Uh, you can uh, find them through the publisher's um, website, uh, um, apt, uh, but it, uh, the good news is for those of you in New York, we have 15 copies here in the Skyscraper Museum's store. So um, as you come to visit our exhibitions, you can also pick up a copy of this book, which is not sold on Amazon. So um, it, it, um, it's a, 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 prized, a prized object uh, and hard won, certainly hard won in the writing by Don, uh, but sometimes a little too hard to get, which is a, a problem that should be remedied. Uh, the cover of the book by Brian Bowen, The American Construction Industry, a, a Historical Evolution and Potential Future, you can see bites off quite um, a big topic. Uh, it also includes a, a, a historical and international um, kind of uh, um, background material. So Brian, as you can tell, is um, a great expert, uh, having worked in the industry himself, and will present uh, both a practitioner's view as well as a historian's view. 
So um, looking at, at one of the slides, I'm not sure if this is a comparison that we ever got around to last week, but if we look at on the left-hand side, a foundation in Chicago, and then on the right-hand side in New York um, at the busy corner that you'll see in several other slides um, with, uh, by both Don and me, uh, of the construction site for the Bankers Trust Building at the corner of Capitol, uh, where Wall Street meets Nassau Street and Broad Street, uh, that was the very beating heart of American capitalism across the street from the New York Stock Exchange, et cetera. Um, that is an idea that I want to talk about briefly because as I did show last week um, in some of these images of um, the overview of the platting of the land, the characteristic um, surveying of Chicago in its big square blocks, um, and the more organic, well, and the, the resulting um, characteristic forms of the Chicago skyscraper, um, which become closer to each other after a height cap is imposed in Chicago after 1892-93. Um, by contrast, New York is the city of towers. And if we look at the turn of the 20th century, um, and uh, my cursor is over the Park Row building that you see right here. Um, and if you look straight down at the comparison um, in the 1920s when the Woolworth building here is the tallest building in the world, Park Row building, tallest at the turn of the 20th century, so he barely makes it to the um, shoulders of the, um, of the, of the great giant uh, Woolworth. So the, the city of towers of slender sites that are a function of um, the size of the lot in New York, which is always densely built up from the colonial days um, in these more, this more kind of organic um, street pattern, uh, but also congested and densified by the demands of business. And if you, as you see in the map that the museum uh, made for the Ten and Taller exhibition based on the database that Don Friedman developed for um, the, in the research for structure of skyscrapers, you can see the business buildings um, in the financial district and all the way up to City Hall um, concentrated in, um, in the year 1900 around Broadway and especially around Wall Street. Um, and you see them here in a photograph here after about 1914, 15, because the equitable building at the center, this gigantic, in fact, Chicago's um, design skyscraper that occupies a full block, um, just one block north of, of uh, Wall Street, but you can see the um, the increasing heights of buildings, but the incredible congestion and densification based on a, a laissez-faire attitude towards height um, that was only curtailed in New York after the zoning law of 1916 was imposed. So um, what is common in New York is really this, um, this, this concentration. Giant buildings like the Woolworth building that you see under construction in order to bring the frame, uh, bring us around to the discussion of, of the frame. Um, I'm showing here for its atypical character, um, certainly of dominating this territory around City Hall Park uh, in an area that you can see that expands to the west, um, to the Hudson River and to the north around what we now call Tribeca, um, which is still 19th century low rise. But the reason that I'm showing the Woolworth building here um, and predicting as we look at um, facades next time is the typical of New York. Um, architects were attached to the historical styles so that the Cathedral of Commerce, which is the overall imagery of, of Cass Gilbert's Woolworth building, um, is detailed through the decoration of the facade of the terracotta cladding um, that we will talk about as in a kind of separate analysis next time. Um, and that idea of style um, and structure is um, come together in the modernist project that is especially advanced from the, 1920, the late 1920s in New York and especially um, into the 1930s and after by um, scholars and, P and uh, curators like Philip Johnson, who you see here from the exhibition that the Museum of Modern Art did in 1933 um, on early skyscrapers. And um, in making the models um, and in um, reducing the message 
from masonry to steel, they established an argument that was not just about technological progress or advancing systems of structure, but an ideology of modernism. Um, and that ideology of modernism um, be, had its apotheosis uh, in the post-war period in the steel and glass curtain wall um, facades of so many buildings and especially uh, within the Miesian model, the kind of paradigm um, for both Chicago and, and New York skyscrapers and then high rises um, around the world in this expression of structure, this minimalist expression of structure that we know isn't entirely honest um, as many people have, uh, arch architectural historians um, have argued, but, but summarizes this kind of um, uh, evolution that seems to be uh, a, a progression that is absolute in, um, in arriving at a certain logic, a logic of modernism. And so it's that historiography in the background with people like Carl Condit, uh, the um, historian of Chicago in the 50s, 60s and after that so formed most people's understanding of the project of modernism and the definition of the Chicago School that we um, will be talking about in this, uh, it, Tom Leslie will be talking about in this session and also um, when we look at facades. Um, so with that, we turn back to structure and frame because both Tom and Don are going to be quite literal um, in looking at the frame um, through, the, through the microscope of, of um, their um, structural analysis and through their structural drawings. But I just wanted to take this um, screenshot of the uh, Getty Art and Architecture thesaurus that one finds online even today to look um, here at the center uh, at the definition of skyscrapers saying, note, exceptionally tall buildings of skeletal frame construction. Um, and Tom and Don are going to show us in the New York and Chicago comparisons in their talks today, how that really um, it, uh, is not an explanation uh, of, um, of the building history uh, in New York or Chicago or indeed anywhere, which is far more complicated. Um, and as um, I invite Tom Leslie now to, to come onto the screen. Oh, I, Tom, I, I forgot to give you your, your, your background introduction with, with all of your books and your, um, your titles and all, but I'm just gonna let you go ahead and, and people can watch in every single one of these four episodes um, how, um, how you, um, you display your expertise without any, um, without any necessary um, floor, uh, flowering of uh, your credentials. So, okay, that is I, absolutely yeah. absolutely fine. <laughs> you can bump me off the screen. Thank you, Carol. Uh, always a, a pleasure to be here. Um, and to, to talk with Don, uh, especially, and with Brian, uh, a great pleasure to have Brian uh, moderating tonight's conversation. Um, and Carol's sort of charge to myself and Don was to take these four aspects of skyscraper construction and sort of go, go deep in, in relatively brief talks. And in thinking about the, uh, how, the importance of a frame, both to how we think about the modern skyscraper and, and in terms of how modern skyscraper was actually put together. This is kind of the, the crossroads. We talked about foundations last week. We're gonna talk about facades uh, in, in a couple of weeks. And the frame, of course, is the, the thing that's right between them. And Don and I, in our little pregame, uh, we're, we're tossing around definitions of frame. And for my purposes, I, I wanna say that there are, we can think of the frame in a couple of different ways. I think the, general public and the architectural public think of it in very architectural terms, that a frame is a kind of rectilinear grid into which you put all the stuff of, of building. And the Chicago sort of paradigm of a, of a framed building architecturally uh, might go back to William LeBaron Jenny's uh, early quote unquote skyscraper, the, the first lighter store of 1879. Uh, this was a, a cast iron and, and timber frame building with brick piers on the outside, uh, a sort of very early hybrid of, of iron uh, and brick put together. Um, and architecturally, this certainly looks like the absolute essence of a, of a frame and, and even a skeleton frame 
uh, a term that has never really been uh, adequately defined, but that has come to represent Chicago construction. But if you look closely at the plan, I wanna argue that this is not a structural frame. In other words, it's not a kind of organic uh, system that takes care of all of the loads on a building uh, internally with, within the, the linear or skeletal uh, elements of, of the frame itself. Uh, because if you look at it, you can see that there is an absolutely massive masonry wall uh, to the right of the plan on the, on the north side of the site and relatively uh, thick masonry elements kind of all around it. And those masonry elements, as we'll talk about uh, at length this evening, are, are doing the work of lateral bracing. Uh, skyscrapers aren't only in danger of falling down, uh, in other words, being vulnerable to gravity, they're also in danger of falling over. Uh, because of wind forces especially. And those masonry walls are sort of rudimentary shear walls. They're doing the job of, of staying the building uh, against wind. Now, Jenny would go on to uh, design the, a, a building that has probably been talked about in more of our conversations between myself and Don than any other, the home insurance building uh, done in Chicago in 1884, often called the first skeleton frame, often called the first skyscraper, uh, debunked, but debunked in ways that I think are interesting for our conversation. Um, if you look at, it's a recognizably an architectural frame, a regular grid uh, with windows that are roughly the same size and same rhythm, uh, punctuating what appears to be uh, a structural grid in, in the way we'd recognize it today. And if you look closely at the plan, though, you see that Jenny is doing the same thing here that he did on the first lighter building. Those dark uh, masonry walls on the top and, and left of the plan are doing a lot of the work of taking the, the lateral forces that, that the building is subjected to. And if you look closely at the perimeter wall, you can see that the, the perimeter walls were a hybrid of brick and iron. And it's this hybrid that was looked at by the, the Talmadge Committee in 1931 when the building was uh, being demolished uh, and caused them to say, oh, well, this is clearly the first iron frame or the first skeleton frame because look, if you take the brick away, uh, that iron column is still holding, uh, holding the weight of the, of, of the building above. And, and this led them to say that the, the building was in fact a, a skeleton frame. Uh, but that kind of removal is also showing that the brick and iron were very clearly working together, that the, you could have conceivably done it the other way around, taken the iron out and shown that the brick actually could hold up uh, most of the building. And when you go in and look at the, the kind of fabric of the building itself, uh, as this uh, reconstruction by uh, one of our students a few years ago uh, shows, the home insurance was really a kind of masonry and iron carapace or shell uh, surrounding a fairly loose, fairly rickety, fairly vulnerable uh, iron frame on the inside. And in fact, it was this hybrid uh, condition that allowed the, the building to stand up not only against gravity, uh, but also against wind. Okay, why was it loose and rickety? Why did it need uh, the brick to stay it? Well, if you look at the model, the blue and green represent two slightly different but related materials. The blue represents cast iron and the green represents wrought iron. These are two variants of the same basic material, uh, pig iron, uh, but they are uh, fabricated or manufactured in a way that makes their chemistry very different. So in cast iron, that's usually iron that's just made with, with regular uh, pig iron with a relatively high carbon content. And that carbon gives cast iron very great compressive strength, uh, but makes it very, very vulnerable in tension uh, because it's very, very brittle. This means that uh, because it has little tensile strength, it's a terrible material to use for beams and builders used the more expensive but stronger intention wrought iron, uh, which was made by melting pig iron and, and literally scraping the carbon deposits uh, out of it to achieve a much lower carbon uh, iron. Uh, wrought iron, relatively good, relatively reliable in tensile strength, uh, not as strong in compression. So wrought iron was typically used for beams, cast iron was typically used uh, for, uh, for columns. And there's a little spoiler alert here down at the bottom. You can sort of see where we're, where we're going with this. The real difference between cast and wrought iron though was in its workability. That cast iron was so brittle meant that it could not be drilled or cut after it came out of the molds. It tended to crack or shatter uh, when you tried to work it. 
Wrought iron, though, was more ductile, softer, easier to drill, easier to cut, uh, more subject to the kind of fabrication uh, activities that we see today uh, in, in modern steel construction. So when you cast uh, an iron column, you are often making a hollow shape, meaning that you were putting a, a mandrel inside the mold and then, then taking it out after it cooled. Um, when that, uh, the iron was poured, the process of cooling was relatively violent. The uh, cast iron piece would twist, it would shrink, uh, you would get it sort of close to what you thought you were getting, uh, but you could never be quite sure of the, of the precise dimensions uh, or location of anything that you were casting onto the column. And so when you see cast iron in building structures, you very often see it either with no connections at all. You can see here that the, the wood beams uh, in, this, in these details are simply resting on a plate on top of the cast iron. Uh, or at most, you would have these kind of fins and shelves that were cast onto the columns onto which you could rest uh, and then actually just pin uh, wrought iron beams. And the reason you could only pin them is those holes and ledges would be mm, sort of roughly where you thought they would be when you were casting them. But there was a degree of imprecision. And all of those fittings had to account for the fact that things had to be moved around, oached into place basically, with no uh, fabrication being done to, to the column itself. Here on the right, you see one of the actual column and uh, beam joints from the home insurance salvaged during its de demolition, now in the, the collection of the Museum of Science and Industry. And you can see that the wrought iron beams are uh, thin because they are rolled. Cast iron column is very, very thick because it's cast. The beam sits on top of a shelf that is cast into the column and it's held in place only by a single pin that goes through a, a lug on the column uh, and a hole that, that's drilled in the wrought iron beam. What this meant was that this connection had no capacity to transmit uh, bending forces from one to the other. And it meant that the frame was subject to racking uh, and moving. And so what that masonry was doing importantly on the home insurance building was providing some stiffness, making the connection between girder and column stiff enough that the building could take wind load not only on those rear masonry walls, but also in the, the kind of hybrid uh, iron and brick structure uh, that, that wrapped around the outside. I think of the home insurance not as a, a, an iron frame, but as a kind of reinforced masonry building, right? It, the, the iron is doing as much work, almost the kind of the work of, of rebar and concrete today uh, as it is carrying the building uh, on its own. Now, in addition to the architectural committee that looked at the home insurance, there was a, 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 a committee put together by the Journal of the Western Society of Engineers, uh, of engineers, who looked at the very same building under demolition and said, uh, architects can call it whatever they want. They can call it a frame uh, if they so choose, but there are important uh, shortcomings basically in the home insurance compared with the way that, that skyscrapers were structured in the 1930s that to this panel made it seem like the building wasn't really as much of a first uh, as the architects and Chicago boosters wanted to, to make it seem. And in particular, they pointed to the fact that the, the masonry did most of the job of carrying the wind load, the lateral force uh, that threatened to rack or, or basically to, to tip over uh, uh, the building. And they also said that the walls weren't what we today call curtain walls, lightweight skins that simply uh, clad the frame. Uh, but they were actually doing a, a lot of the work of giving the building its strength, both uh, laterally and in terms, of, in terms of gravity. And this to me is, is a kind of working definition of what we might call a modern skyscraper, uh, giving up the known strength and security of masonry walls and piers for curtain walls and steel wind bracing of the modern skeleton building. So how do we get from the home insurance to the modern skeleton uh, frame? Well, the, the first step was to take all of that masonry bracing and instead of putting it around the outside where it was competing for space with windows, subject of our, our next talk, uh, taking those uh, masonry walls and turning them 90 degrees, right, perpendicular uh, to the exterior walls and allowing then the exterior walls to be much lighter. And as you see here, the Tacoma building 1889 uh, made predominantly of glass, allowing as much daylight in uh, as possible. When you do a kind of anatomical reconstruction of the Tacoma, what you find is that you have, again, 
a very, very loose collection of cast iron columns and wrought iron beams that are simply pinned together, uh, that have no sort of uh, lateral integrity of their own and that rely entirely on those massive shear walls to take the, the forces of wind uh, and transmit those to the ground. <clears throat> uh, that works fine structurally, but as uh, companies wanted larger and larger spaces, as building owners wanted more and more flexibility, those internal shear walls became a, a problem too. And it's right about this time that an answer uh, shows up that allows engineers to create frames that are actually self-braced, that not only handle all of the gravity load, but that also are able to themselves take the lateral wind loads that, that these buildings were subject to. And the answer, not surprisingly, is steel. Steel has a very, very precise carbon content that really balances the compressive strength of cast iron with the ductility or, or workability of wrought iron. So the, the Bessemer process, which becomes commercially viable in the late uh, 1880s, basically uses oxygen to blow all of the carbon out of a, a, a bunch of molten pig iron, uh, and then relies on very, very precise amounts of carbon being added back in, either through a coke or coal, to achieve this kind of precise uh, amount of carbon between 0.1 and 1% that gives it some of the compressive strength of cast iron, uh, balances that almost exactly with the, with uh, tensile strength. Steel is one of the rare materials that has almost exactly equal compressive and tensile strength, which makes it very, very good for beams and adequate for columns. But the key thing is that this tensile strength comes with ductility. So if you uh, make a, a rolled steel uh, element, you can come back and you can drill it, you can cut it, you can slice it in ways that are very, very precise. This allows another way of, of connecting iron uh, elements and building frames, uh, and that is riveting. Riveting relies on holes drilled in beams and columns, uh, reamed on site so that they match very precisely, uh, and then uh, connected with hot rivets driven by either hand hammers at first, or as you see on the right, pneumatic hammers, uh, to create a, a very, very tight uh, connection between one element and the other. As the rivet cools, it actually shrinks. And so you get the benefit not only of the rivet itself, but the friction fit uh, between the, the, the surfaces of the, the girder uh, and the column. Uh, and here, uh, generously provided by uh, Carol, uh, you see uh, images of riveters uh, on site. The one in the middle has just pulled out a hot rivet and is about to throw it. Uh, up to the, the site where the connection is actually being made. On the right, you see two riveters with a pneumatic hammer uh, connecting a, 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 a stitch plate and a, a column uh, on the Empire State Building. Because steel can be rolled thin, uh, you can get very, very precise sheets. You can place them next to each other with a great deal of accuracy. You can ream them out so that the holes in both plates are exactly equal to one another, which allows the rivet to bear uh, quite consistently. And then on the right, you see a couple of very typical riveted connections that actually take the, the stiffness of say a truss and basically distill all of that rigidity into the joint itself. So at first you see uh, buildings that are stayed by cross bracing or portal frames, and eventually uh, you get these connections called moment connections where the, the stiffness actually kind of resolves itself uh, into the, the joint itself. And, and these just visually look like they are much, much stiffer than the kind of pinned and ledged connections uh, that you see uh, in, uh, in, in cast iron building. So here on the left, uh, a handful of, of uh, wind bracing types that are, are used in the early 1890s. And uh, here, William LeBaron and Jenny talking in the early 1890s uh, discusses the evolution of the, the Chicago frame or Chicago construction, uh, the, the typical Chicago skyscraper as directly related to this ability to go from uh, uh, relatively loose connections in cast iron with quote unquote ingenious devices to tie the beams to the columns, uh, sort of faith-based lateral bracing. Uh, and then as soon as riveted steel columns come along, uh, you get a building that is engineered, he says, as, as well as a steel railroad bridge uh, of the first order, right? Built like bridges is, is one of my ways of thinking about this next generation uh, of steel framed buildings. <clears throat> 
Now, one of the things that distinguishes Chicago from New York, and this may be something that, that Don and I can talk about uh, in the, in the Q&A, is that Chicago seems to take to steel much, much sooner uh, than New York. And, and the riveted steel frame really becomes a hallmark of Chicago construction in the 1890s. And it takes a little bit longer uh, till the early 1900s for that to become as common or, or as pervasive uh, in New York City. Now, what happens architecturally is that once you get this very, very lightweight kind of self-braced frame, you've taken all of the structural duties away from the exterior enclosure. And this frees that enclosure up to be a, a, a true curtain wall, a true veneered facade in, in the parlance of the day, something we'll talk about uh, in a couple of weeks. But it also makes uh, potentially a very, very lightweight framing system on the inside that maximizes the amount of uh, space that you can rent maximizes the flexibility uh, as you're uh, leasing out the space. There are no shear walls uh, slicing the, the space into, into smaller uh, elements. And it also gives you a couple of ways of thinking about the building architecturally, the Reliance building, uh, Charles Atwood, the design architect in, in, in a Burnham's office is thinking of the Reliance as a, as a clad frame, as a, a frame that he's wrapping a skin around after 1893, for reasons that I'm sure we'll get into in a couple of years or a couple of weeks, um, Louis Sullivan thinks about the building as an infilled frame. The frame becomes not only the way the building stands up, it also becomes the primary expression architecturally uh, of the building. And Sullivan, of course, is the master of taking that frame and, and turning it basically into a, a visual uh, or architectural language. Um, this is the second phase of uh, Schlesinger and Meyer, uh, later to be known as Carson's and, and now known to, to Chicagoans as the downtown target, uh, a, a probably uh, appropriate uh, reuse of, of the building. And if you look closely, you can see that this uh, second phase of the building was all a riveted steel frame. The first phase was uh, partly cast iron, due not to any sort of conservatism on, on Sullivan's part, but uh, rather because steel was still relatively difficult uh, to come by. So that is sort of a, a capsule summary of the, of the Chicago frame from home insurance, 1885, uh, 15 or 16 years uh, up to 1900. Uh, I will uh, join this guy in taking a quick break. And Don, I think, will take us uh, through the New York story uh, next. OK, so um, as Tom mentioned, uh, we're, we're trying to give sort of something other than the normal, the normal story. And uh, I'm gonna be jumping around a lot in terms of time and place, but I think my narrative is pretty straightforward. If you just ignore the fact that, for example, I'm starting with the Empire State Building, which is obviously a, uh, a post 1900 building. Um, the, the picture on the left, and that's a, an elevation of the building, a lower floor plan and a, an upper floor plan. Uh, this is actually logistics drawing. This is showing how the steel would be delivered to the building for erection. Uh, if you look at the plan, you see the letters uh, on the lower plan, you have E in the upper left corner, for example. Those are which crane would be delivering steel to which area. So this is very much not a structural drawing. It is a, a, a logistics drawing. But I like it because it reflects very much the way engineers think about buildings in general. Um, which is that we reduce, we, we model columns and beams sort of as lines in our, in our heads when we're working on them. Um, and it is, it's, a, it's a reductive way of doing things, which is what engineering is based on. Uh, if you tried to analyze the stress in every single rivet in the Empire State Building's frame, you would never finish designing it, uh, whereas it was actually designed very quickly and um, built very well. The picture on the right, which is a photograph taken as the, uh, the cellar framing was being put in place well below street level, uh, you see the stair in the upper right hand photograph of the, the picture that's going up to the street. Um, and you see the grid, so it is still this, this uh, Cartesian grid, um, but the, the lines all have thickness and the connections are not simply two lines meeting, but there, there's stuff going on at the connections. And that's, that's reality. And that matters in terms of how things actually function and how they are designed. And that, that's, that's what I wanna talk about. Um, and just in terms of, for the rest of my talk, uh, I need a word to discuss uh, the, the, the structure that supports load um, 
as opposed to just you know structure in general. The structure that supports load in the, in the skyscraper. What supports the gravity load? What resists wind load? And I'm going to use the word frame, even though to some extent I'm talking about things other than what we might traditionally think of as as frame elements. Um, so you know, one of the questions that comes up is when did people stop using the walls to carry load? And you can't even answer that with a simple answer. Um, are we talking about when they when they intentionally stopped using masonry or when they actually stopped using masonry? Uh, one reason the Empire State Building is interesting is that it had one of the first curtain walls that really couldn't carry load because of the way it was detailed. Um, even the building with a very light curtain wall, like the Reliance Building, does have continuous masonry lines along the columns and the piers and along the spandrel beams. Whereas the, the Empire State Building's curtain wall is broken up between different materials that sort of unintentionally create expansion joints. Um, I, I say that the process wasn't complete until the 1970s because it took a very long time for, uh, for engineers and for code officials to realize that if you didn't include a lot of expansion joints in a, in a facade, uh, it was going to carry load. And um, I've worked on high rise buildings from the 1960s that have that were built with an expansion joint, maybe every six floors. And when you look at the numbers on them, the, the, the curtain walls of those buildings, the walls that were not intended to carry load have been carrying load basically since the building was built. So even though the idea of a skeleton frame as we generally define it goes back to 1890, the first two buildings that have complete steel frames intended to carry the curtain walls were built in 1890, one in Chicago and one in New York. So nobody wins the race. Um, so even though that technology goes back to 1890, it took another 80 years or so before people really understood all the implications. Um, building codes and particularly the New York City Building Code required thicker walls than were necessary for curtain walls. Uh, in other words, once you remove the structural function, as Tom said, from the wall. The wall can be quite thin, but it can't be if the code requires it to be very thick. Um, and engineers in New York certainly were, were often going to the building department and saying, I can prove that the wall is not supposed to be carrying load. Can you let me make the wall thinner than the code requires? And they very often did get permission for that, but the, but the code still required those thick walls until 1901. So it took a long time for people to understand that you, you could stop building all that masonry. Um, the uh, one reason that I like Tom's phrase, uh, build like bridges, is that the technology for the steel framing came from, from uh, engineers working in other fields and particularly working on bridges, working on truss bridges. Uh, so the, the steel technology that was used to build skyscrapers comes from a field where there is nothing but metal. If you look at the truss bridge, there's nothing to carry the load but the truss itself. When you start embedding those trusses, you turn the truss on end, and, and lo and behold, you have a, uh, a frame for a building. Um, but then you embed it in masonry. And how does the load move back and forth between the steel and the masonry? And that's something that even today is difficult to define. It was pretty much the, the, impossible for people 100, 100 years ago, 120 years ago, because they didn't have the information as to how, how load would transfer. Something else that was still being developed in the 1880s, 1890s uh, was what, what, what is usually referred to in engineering as the column formula. Um, you, you would think it's pretty straightforward as to say how much load a column can carry, but it's not. There's a very complicated relationship between the slenderness of the column. And this is not the engineering definition, but just as a, a working definition, let's say the height of the column divided by its thickness. Um, there's a very complicated relationship between those two things. And uh, it, the, the formula we use today was more or less hit upon in the 1940s, late 1940s. So there was a great deal of debate about how do you define the load that you can allow on a slender column uh, in 1890 and 1900, that debate was still going on. Uh, the, the last thing I want to discuss is that what you have inadvertently in these buildings, as I've already said, you have a metal frame and you have around it uh, masonry. You basically have parallel load paths. The load can go through the metal or it can go through the masonry. And we don't get to decide wh which way it's going to go. When you have load shared that in that manner, 
it follows the stiffer the, the stiffer element. So if the masonry is three times as stiff as, as the uh, as the steel, the masonry will carry three times as much of the load as the steel will. Um, and that means that if you have a, a, a small column embedded in a large pier, uh, the pier is going to carry the load as long as it can, basically until the masonry fails. Um, looking at things today, how do we how do we define the different types of buildings. And in the, in the run up to this lecture, as uh, Tom and Carol and I were talking about things, um, I, I said, you know, there, there's a the spectrum here. And on one end of the spectrum is buildings that have nothing but bearing walls, nothing but masonry walls, and the floors are supported by walls everywhere within the building. Um, and the, the, uh, the New York Tribune building, which is a, a tall building of the 1870s, is a good example of that. On the other end of the spectrum, you have the, the glass wall skyscrapers uh, starting in the 1950s, where the wall cannot carry load. Right? That pane of glass will not carry structural load. Uh, and therefore, you know that the load is in the metal frame the way that you want. And in between, you have a lot of different possibilities. Um, I have categorized this in the past as you have bearing wall buildings, you have, there's an intermediate form called a cage building, and you have skeleton frame buildings. And the way you, you decide which category a building is in is by looking at how it carries load. If the wall load is carried on the frame, it's a skeleton frame building. If the floor loads are carried on the frame, but the wall load is self-supporting, then it's a cage building. And that's what the, uh, the home insurance building in Chicago was. And if all the load is carried on the walls, you, then it's a bearing wall building. And even what I've just said is very much a simplified example, a simplified version of this. So here's the, the, uh, a building in New York that gives an example of how this can be sort of complicated. This is uh, the 1892 Mail and Express, which was a newspaper, the Mail and Express building in New York. Um, and it's a, sort of a, a, an L-shaped plot of land. Uh, you have the narrow facade with the tower on the left facing Broadway and the wider facade on the right with two flags up on the roof is facing Fulton Street. Um, and this is a skeleton frame building. This is classified as a skeleton frame building because the frame was designed to carry the load of the exterior walls, uh, except the frame was not designed to carry the load of the facades, the two street facades. And the reason, if you look at them, they are very heavily ornamented facades. In 1892, skeleton framing was still in its infancy. This is something like the the fifth or sixth skeleton frame building built in New York City. Um, and having to carry all of that ornament on the frame would be very difficult. Even today, it's difficult. We know how to do it now. But in 1892, it was still, people weren't sure how you would do this. So rather than even attempt it, they just let the, the two street facades be bearing walls that carried their own weight. And the rest of the building was carried on the frame. Obviously, the engineers knew how to carry a wall on the frame, and they did so. And that's the definition of a skeleton frame building. But not all of the load in this building is carried on the frame. So it, it's a hybrid. And the, the reason that I generally try to avoid that word in this discussion is that so many buildings are hybrids, you have to ask, well, what's not? Um, and actually, this picture sort of accidentally shows another example. The, building, the tall building on the far left of the picture is the, the Western Union building, um, but not as it was built. Uh, the bottom of the building is, has white stripes running across it. That's part of the original facade. What was above that originally, where there's now just a plain brick facade, uh, was a very tall mansard roof. This is 1875. This is another very early tall building in New York. Um, in the 1880s, the mansard roof was removed and replaced with the, the more traditional extension you see here to get a little more room. Uh, and then this entire block was demolished for, for the AT&T building uh, after 1900. So the, the Western Union building had a skeleton frame mansard roof on top of a bearing wall building uh, as, it's, as it was built. As you see it in this picture, it has a cage frame extension on top of a bearing wall base, another hybrid. Uh, the, the Gillander building, which um, was, it, it's at Carroll's favorite corner, uh, Wall Street and Nassau Street. In the, the picture on the right, uh, Nassau Street is the street running diagonally from the center, uh, from the bottom center of the photograph up to the right, and Wall Street's the, run, the street intersecting it running off to the left. Um, this is the most slender 
early skyscraper. The height of the building divided by its base width is, is about 10 and a half. That is, even today, that's considered to be a very slender building, uh, but it was extraordinarily slender for its time. Um, in the demo, it, 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 and that's, I should add, this building existed for 13 years. You think about the effort it took to build it, well, it simply was not uh, economically feasible in the long run, because when you subtract off the thickness of the masonry walls from the floor plate, there's not actually a lot of rentable space in that building. Uh, and by building a bigger building, you could, you could have a much more efficient uh, function of the building. Um, so the building on the left is about 13 years after it was built and it's being demolished. And if you look closely at the demolition picture, um, you can see, hold on one second. Yeah, okay, uh, you, you can see some, some pr fairly heavy framing. The, uh, the spandrel beams on the short facade on the left are not actually beams, they're trusses. Uh, and the spandrel beams uh, on the long facades in the end bays are also trusses. And this is, this is very much uh, the wind bracing of this slender skeleton frame building. Um, the problem is, look at, and, and that's a lot of steel. If you compare this to the photograph that Tom put up of the Reliance building, this is much more steel per square foot of floor space. But if you compare the amount of steel in this relatively heavy skeleton to the amount of masonry in the wall, um, there's still a lot of masonry there. And it is not, the masonry is not strong enough to brace the building in the narrow direction as a shear wall, but it is strong enough to uh, brace the columns basically to make the columns less slender by spreading their load out through the masonry. Uh, so even though this was analyzed and designed as a skeleton frame building, there's, there's really no question that the, the masonry was helping the steel function. So is this a pure skeleton frame or not? And um, my take on it is that it's, it's basically, it was intended to be a skeleton frame building, but it was a hybrid. Uh, one of the ways that you can tell that this unintentional action was going on is what happened after World War II. Uh, once two things happened, and the first one was that people stopped using masonry walls for tall buildings and went to glass and metal panel. And the second thing that happened was that um, structural engineering software came along. So rather than designing this kind of building by hand using relatively crude methods, uh, engineers were starting to be able to be much more efficient in how they designed their steel framing. And as a result, there was this sudden, a series of tall buildings and a series of incidents in tall buildings that moved too much. Um, perhaps the most famous is the, 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 uh, the John Hancock building in Boston. Uh, there are a number here in New York, the Gulf and Western building is another example at one Central Park West. These are buildings that were known for moving too much under wind load. And you ask, well, how does that happen? And the answer is that engineers didn't understand how much they had to control wind movement from wind load because they had never had to in the past because the masonry walls were helping. When the masonry walls were no longer there to help, we found out we had a problem with the way we were designing buildings. Not that they were unsafe, but that they moved too much under lateral load because they had been relying on supposedly non-structural elements. In other words, all of the old buildings were hybrids. This is what replaced the Gillinder building. Um, that's the Bankers Trust building under construction on the left. And again, we have one of these very nice Cartesian grids in steel. Uh, it's, it's a much, it's, it's, this was, building was designed about 14 years after Gillinder and it is a much more modern steel frame. Uh, if you ignored, if you only focused on the steel that could almost pass for a modern steel frame, it's somewhat heavier than the frames we build today. Uh, it, on the right, we have a, a photograph from something like 1932, uh, taken from uh, the west side of Broadway, looking across, looking east across Broadway. Uh, Bankers Trust is the sort of the darker building in the middle with the pyramid roof. Uh, right behind it, you see the ghost of 40 Wall Street um, in the haze. Uh, to the left of the building, you have American Surety uh, with and, and American Surety building. If you look at the facade, you'll see it's darker on the left and lighter on the right. The lighter portion is an extension that was built after the original building. To the left of that, there's the equitable building again. And on the right, you have uh, one Wall Street. And I, I use this particular picture of Bankers Trust in its completed state because you're looking at a lot line wall. Uh, we're, we're looking at the, uh, at the west wall of Bankers Trust, 
um, which is facing a shorter neighbor rather than facing a street. And that wall is mostly masonry. Um, there are windows in it, uh, but it, it, it's it's very much not, it, it, to use a phrase Tom used in the, uh, in the first talk, um, it's a wall with punched windows. It's not a frame of masonry. Um, and I, I had this slide all ready to go before I saw Tom's slide with the, there's the Tacoma building again on the left. Uh, for those who don't immediately recognize it, that's uh, Burj Khalifa on the right. Um, these are two buildings that are very different in terms of materials, location, um, age, height, particularly. Uh, but why am I saying they're similar frame types? Well, how are the loads supported in these two buildings? In both of these buildings, uh, most of the gravity load is taken by, uh, by, by shear walls. Um, and there are a few columns here and there to take the load that isn't taken by walls. Both of these buildings have very light exterior curtain walls. Um, and uh, both of these buildings carry wind load, carry, well, and Burj Khalifa seismic load as well in their, in their shear walls. So it's a similar conception of how, a, of how a frame works, just on two very different scales and using different materials. But besides the fact that this shows that engineers never actually have original ideas, we just keep recycling better and better versions of the old ones. Um, I, I think that this gets to the question of, you have to look at how the load is carried. How does Tacoma, which does not have a skeleton frame, how does it have such a light curtain wall? And the answer is that it's using shear walls. Burj Khalifa, how does it have such a light curtain wall despite its incredible height? And the answer is it's using shear walls there. It's a similar conception of how a frame works. Um, back to the Reliance building. Um, this is not a New York building, neither is Tacoma, but they, they, the, they happen to show what, what uh, I really want to talk about here. So there's the Reliance shortly after it was completed on the left. On the right, you have an architectural floor plan and those dark squares are where the columns are. And uh, despite the, the bay windows, you notice the columns follow more or less straight lines through the building, uh, which is something you would expect when you have a moment frame, which is how this building is braced against wind. Here are two construction photos. Um, and particularly in the one on the right, if you look at the, the corner column, the column on the far right of the, the half-built building, you can see straight through it. Um, Tom actually showed a, a picture of a, what's called a gray column. Uh, and they're called that because they're named after a fellow named Gray, not because of their color. Um, it, it's a, a type of built-up column that was popular uh, not in New York, interestingly. Uh, it was popular mostly in the Midwest. Um, Tom has said in other talks we've both been involved with that he thinks the Reliance may be the first modern skyscraper, and I, I think that might be a reasonable argument, uh, but I, what I want to talk about is um, how, how the loads work in it. The reason that it's the, the reason that it, it could be called the first modern skyscraper is that its walls are, are very much open window. Uh, and the rest is terracotta rather than brick. So it really can't carry much, the, the walls can't carry much vertical load. Here's a structural framing plan on the left. Um, and if you look at where the columns are, they, they look like sort of little Maltese crosses. That's what the gray column looks like. And my next slide, I have a close up so you can really see what that looks like. Uh, one thing that, that's sort of interesting here um, for, what you need for a moment frame is the, the beams to, to go directly to the column. And what's reasonably clear looking at this plan is that not all of the columns are engaged as part of the moment frame. In other words, the, the designer did not take advantage of every column uh, to resist wind, suggesting that he thought he had enough wind resistance without them. You've got heavy girders uh, along the two street facades, which says, it actually says plate girder. Um, and there are other places where you have beams framing into the columns in such a way that suggests that they're, they're moment frame. But there are quite a few uh, places where the, the beams do not frame directly into the column, meaning that that column is not part of the, the wind load carrying system. It's only carrying gravity load. Um, just, I want to have a close up picture of a gray column. Uh, the picture on the right is not a piece of the Reliance building. It is a gray column sitting in the yard having been fabricated. 
about to be shipped off to another building. And I've turned this picture 90 degrees to put the column in a more or less vertical orientation. What it consists of is four pairs of angles. So where you see where someone has written on the column. Um, there are two lines of text. Each line of text is on one is on the leg of one angle. And those four pairs of angles are sort of arranged in a, in a square. And then there are little diagonal pieces, little diagonal pieces of steel strap connecting them. Uh, the picture on the upper left, I think, gives a, a good a good picture of a gray column in section. Uh, the, the, the very dark T shape is a pair of angles back to back, and the uh, the, the white rectangles connecting them are the uh, those brackets. The thing about a gray column is that by modern standards, it's not going to work very well, um, particularly for moment. And in the moment frame, the columns do have to be able to carry bending. Um, so that they, they, they can't just work for gravity load. Um, and this column at the corner of a building, uh, and based on the framing layout, is one that, that would be part of the moment frame for carrying wind and should be able to carry moment. The problem is that you don't have a direct load path from the, from the pair of angles on one side of the column to the pair of angles on the opposite side of the column. And that's really what's something that you need. Without that, you're relying on warping the, uh, the brackets connecting the pairs, which is an incredibly inefficient way to transfer load and frankly, isn't gonna work well. Um, modern steel design looks at buckling of slender elements. And these are columns that are composed entirely of slender elements, the, the angles in those, those brackets. Uh, the same book that I cribbed these nice pictures of, of Reliance from, I cribbed this, um, a, a, a figure showing the different types of columns that were used in steel frame buildings circa 1906 or so. Uh, and I have added the color code. The, the columns that I've marked in green are ones that would work pretty well under current code. We, and again, I, I, I feel like I have to emphasize this. We're not any smarter than the people who were designing buildings in 1890 or 1895. We have much more information that, uh, based on research Search over the years. So we, we have access to more knowledge, uh, whether or not we're smarter. Um, so using taking advantage of 120 years of research since the Reliance building was built, um, I, I know that, for example, a, a Z-bar column with covers is, a very, is going to be a very strong column. Uh, there, there are no projecting flanges. Um, as long as the rivets connecting the different pieces are at a reasonable spacing, that's going to work well. Um, the latticed angle column, that's four angles arranged in a square with uh, like truss-like um, bracing between them, um, might work well. That's why it has a yellow mark. Uh, it depends on how, on how often the bracing is, on how the bracing is arranged. Um, the, uh, the, what's called a channel column here was extremely popular in New York. And that's a built-up box column using two channels and either a pair of plates or again, trust like latticing, but except for very lightly loaded columns, they're typically done with plates. And that's a, a very good column by current standards. And if you look, there's the gray column. Well, it's, I'm, I've marked it as red because I can't really make that work under current code. Now, the building has been standing since 1895. Obviously the columns are working. So how do they work if you don't have if you don't have that load transfer? And the answer is that the individual pieces are kept from buckling by the adjacent masonry. I mean, it's pretty clear that if those angles tried try to buckle uh, outward, they would hit masonry. Um, so uh, even in this building, which Tom rightly says the the masonry walls are not designed to carry load and really can't. But th there's enough masonry there to still serve as local bracing for columns that would otherwise not work. Uh, I, I just want to read from this same book a description of the gray column. Uh, this column has been used in a number of prominent buildings, including the Elliott Square and Guarantee buildings in Buffalo, uh, designed by Chicagoans, uh, the Reliance and Fisher buildings in Chicago, and the Chamber of Commerce and maybe buildings in Detroit. Um, so in other words, this is, this is a column that was popular in the Midwest. And I, I can't tell you why specifically, and that's something that I think Tom and I will have to discuss for a bit. Uh, by many engineers, this form of column is not regarded with favor as what we've pointed out under the later consideration of eccentric loading. In other words, the column doesn't work when it's in bending. Um, so if you have 
a very slender building like Gillender or, or a building with very light curtain walls like Reliance, the masonry can still contribute by keeping the columns properly braced. And therefore, even these buildings are to some degree hybrid buildings. So uh, I finally get around to talking about New York on my last slide. Um, this is a sort of a timeline of buildings that I very carefully have selected out of a few hundred possible possibilities. Um, the Produce Exchange in New York uh, was, a, was sort of a, an early skyscraper, a proto skyscraper, whatever phrase you want to use. Um, the small portions of the floor load at the perimeter of the building were carried on beams that rested on the masonry piers that, that were surrounding the, the columns. In other words, there were columns in all of the piers, and then there was a brick pier as fireproofing and because you needed brick for your wall, and a small number, a small percentage of the load, and I'm saying less than 5%, I think it's actually more like 2%, but I don't remember the exact number, uh, of the load in the floors goes to those beams that are supported on the piers. Um, the following year, 1885, the home insurance building was built and that 5% at the home insurance building is 0%. That is the thing that is unique about the home insurance building. It is, as far as we know, the first building where the walls were not carrying any gravity load from the floor. And if you think about the home insurance building as being claimed to be the first skyscraper, first of all, the difference between 5% and 0% is for engineers very often rounding error. Um, but there's, a, there's a, an intent here, and the, the beams that carried that 5% in the produce exchange were intentionally sitting on masonry rather than on metal. So we won't say that it's a rounding error. Um, but the other thing is that it's taken me, whatever it is, 20 minutes to describe what I'm talking about here. And we're talking about the difference between 5% and 0%. That's much less dramatic than saying that the home insurance building was a skeleton frame and something completely new. Uh, and I'm not saying that the Pros Exchange somehow is a better building than home insurance. It was not. Um, it's simply they're different points on that spectrum, and they're very close to one another. Um, New York's building of the two first skeletons was the London and Lancashire Bank building on Pine Street, um, a small sort of slab building, very narrow on the street, very deep along the lot. Um, the most interesting thing about it, besides for the fact that it's the first skeleton frame in, in New York, is that the side walls were very thin for that era. So again, obviously the people who were building it understood that, that they were, that their intent was to carry all of the load on the skeleton. Uh, the Mellon Express building I've already talked about, um, it's a skeleton frame building uh, with two street facades that are self-supporting. Um, the American Surety building, which is sort of the... Uh, held up as New York's first truly modern skeleton frame building, um, except that the two rear facades, the two facades that didn't face streets, uh, the bottom eight stories were of, of exterior wall were self-supporting. And I'm not entirely sure why. Obviously, it didn't have to be that way. I suspect it may have been in part because of concerns about fire, similar to the uh, in Chicago where the code forced you to have very thick walls facing lot lines. And then the last two I put in here to show that things go, don't go in a straight line. Uh, 142 Fifth Avenue is a 12 story building, um, excuse me, is a 10 story building uh, with a slenderness of about 4.9, which is a very slender building. Again, even today, slenderness of five is, is uh, catches your eye as a, for tall buildings. Um, it was a cage frame building, cast iron columns, uh, steel beams. That's what carried the interior floor load and the walls carried the wind load. Um, 1900, 840 Broadway, uh, 12 stories, not as slender, but still slender enough, a slender, slenderness of 3.2, um, was a pure bearing wall building, uh, exterior bearing walls carrying, carrying all the load. Um, the last two buildings were built by an architect, uh, were designed by an architect named Robert Maynicki. And he's sort of an interesting fellow because he had a business running in the 1890s and 1900s, building for the most part loft buildings, which is what both of these buildings were, uh, sometimes for office use, sometimes for light industrial use. Uh, and all his, it, it, as far as I can tell, all his clients cared about was getting a certain amount of space for a certain budget. Um, and most of Manicki's buildings are cage frame buildings, 
Uh, some of them are bearing walls, some of them are skeleton frame. And it seems to me what he was doing in his own practice uh, was sort of what New Yorkers were doing overall, which is using whatever worked at that, at that moment for what you were doing. In other words, there was no grand theory of skeleton frames are better, uh, or we should, be, we should be using the most modern technology. Um, they had several different technologies available to them. And people in New York tended to use whichever one made sense for them at that moment. Uh, it was often driven by non-structural concerns. It was driven by the need to support a very ornate exterior wall, uh, for example. Um, or in Manicki's case, the, the need to keep the cost as absolute rock bottom as possible because his, his clients were not interested in paying for fancy architecture or for structural theory. So if I have to describe, the, the, after all of this discussion, if I have to describe sort of the New York attitude in 1895 and 1900, it was what's the, the technology that we have, they wouldn't have used the word technology, but just never mind that. What's the technology we have that will let us build this building with the least problems, with the least effort? And sometimes that was a skeleton frame building, and sometimes that was a bearing wall building, and sometimes it was a cage building, and almost always it was some form of hybrid. So I, now that I've completely muddled the water, muddied the waters, uh, time for some discussion. Thank you, Don and Tom. Um, and we will shortly be joined by Brian, who needs to turn this camera on. And there he is. Um, so now we see the addition of Brian Bowen, uh, who is, as you saw by um, his book, a historian of the American construction industry, um, as well as in his uh, career of, uh, of quite a few decades uh, in the construction industry. He retired some years ago as the, from the, as the president of Hanscom. Um, where, and he built, has built buildings around the world, but especially in um, Great Britain, Canada, and the US. So Brian also um, is the founding president of the Construction um, History Society of America, which came as an outgrowth of the, of the British um, original. Uh, and so in all, with all of these hats and with all of this experience, um, Brian, we look to you to um, pose some questions. Uh, for our audience, if you um, present your questions in the chat box, I will try to read them and introduce them if we have some additional time. But Brian, um, now you take over for the conversation. Okay. Thank you, Carol. And thank you, Tom and Don, again, for uh, extraordinary uh, detailed examination of this subject. And I think proving that construction history really does matter. Going back and and tracing the roots of how we got from there to here uh, is really has some value and some worth. Um, I think my first question is, why did it take so long? Now, uh, in uh, 17, let me just check the, the date. In 1781, the Iron Bridge in Colebrook Dale in Shropshire was, uh, was built. And some of you are very familiar with that, I'm sure. There's a nice picture of it in my book, by the way and a little bit of story about it, uh, how it was uh, designed and built. 1781, in fact, uh, Thomas Jefferson, I don't think he actually visited there, but he did have a picture in his uh, residence of that bridge. So it's very impressive. Uh, 1781, and now, where are we? We're talking roughly 1880 before things got going in New York and Chicago, 100 years, you know. <laughs> well, I think there's all kinds of reasons for that. And I'd be interested to hear your some of your uh, uh, opinions about it all, but the, um, uh, in America, the very first ironworks, as far as I can uh, uh, trace, goes back to 1646 in Saugus, north of Boston. And subsequent to that time, they proliferated, usually in, uh, thick, in thick woods and creeks and valleys to be hidden away from the colonial authorities who didn't like the colonists and doing their own, uh, building their or smelting their own iron. And in 1750, the British Parliament comes along and slaps out the, um, the um, Iron Act, which is uh, uh, intended to prohibit them from doing this, and which was widely ignored, as you can imagine, <laughs> by 
the settlers at that time. And really, it wasn't until the New Republic was formed that, uh, that the industry as such, of, of, in this case of building iron, building iron with the use of charcoal, of which there was plenty of wood to, uh, to build that source, and plenty of water power, especially in New England and the Alleghenies and so on. And, um, but as soon as the Republic sinks, the, the production of iron increases significantly, um, in part uh, not for particularly structural reasons, but because of the need for nails is the biggest thing. Nails have been imported from, from England all, all that time and were very valuable. And of course, uh, with the bulk of construction at that time being wood, uh, to put wood together needed either very elaborate joints, which they, would, they, they we couldn't be bothered with, and uh, would nail the joints together. There are stories that uh, the colonists would, uh, or the residents at that time, would um, actually burn fences down to get at the nails. <laughs> So a good iron business begins to develop. And then, of course, in the early, uh, by 18, 1820s or so, the railroads come along. And again, the iron for the railroads is needed. And the production of iron just begins to, to, really, um, to really boom. But why did it still take so long before um, the industry had, uh, adopted this? And there were many factors behind that. I'd just be interested, Donald and Tom, if you got any thoughts about I've got uh, I've got a thought uh, I don't know how how accurate it is um, you need uh, uh, if you look at even the earliest skyscrapers so if we want to say the Tribune building in New York 1874 even the earliest of them there's a bunch of related technologies that are required to make the building work um, elevators are sort of one of the obvious one and, and the safety elevator is until the 1850s uh, in terms of you know, skeleton framing, um, you need some ability to be able to analyze a frame. And again, the, the, earliest, the earliest American textbooks on truss analysis are the 1850s. Obviously, there was, you could get training in Europe uh, and you could, you could be trained in the US using European books, but just to give you a, a sense of how primitive engineering was in the US, it's not, you, you can't analyze a truss using an American made text till the 1850s. And the last thought is that it's not, it, it doesn't actually take as long as you think in some ways, the, it, it comes back to a, a really ridiculous question, which is what's a building? Um, because you have various forms of metal framed towers. And in New York there, for example, there's some shot towers, tall towers where you drop molten lead and it turns into shot by the time it reach the, reaches the bottom, it turns into little spheres of lead by the time it reaches the bottom. Um, and there were several in New York that were metal framed with, uh, with brick infill walls and tall, slender structures. The thing is, they had no interior floors, so I wouldn't call them a building. <laughs> but you do have um, the ability to build something like that. And I saw one of the questions is, what's a shear wall? Uh, those frames were cast iron columns, cast iron beams, and then the brick infill wall was there to, to prevent racking to, to take the wind load. Uh, and the shear wall is simply a wall that's, that is designed to, to do that, to carry wind load by the wall doesn't, doesn't rack. So the wall is in shear and that's why it's called a shear wall. So it's, part of it is, I don't think it's as long as you think it is. Um, and part of it is simply the backwardness of American technology until after the Civil War. And if you look at it from you know, the 18, the first wrought iron beams rolled in the US are, are in the 1850s. It's 20 years until you get uh, Tribune and Western Union. It's 30 years until you get some big buildings. It's not actually that long. Okay. Yeah, I, 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 could, I could point you to some big churches in France that took longer to build than that 110 years, right? But every, everything is relative. Um, and I, I, I think that to me, it's, it's a case of um, what evolutionary biologists called punctuated equilibrium, right? Things sort of putter on for a while and a new development comes along and all of a sudden, in hindsight, we recognize that there's something new happened there. Um, and I, I think it is, you know, the wrought iron beams that get rolled for the first time, as Don said, and then when, when the Bessemer process comes online, that's actually very, very quick, uh, 1885, 
um, steel is used in, in the home insurance. That is one thing that the home insurance can claim is that it was the first building in Chicago anyway to use a, a, an actual steel beam uh, in the upper floors. Um, it, and it's adopted very, very quickly uh, in Chicago. It's just that, that leading up to that, um, there is this kind of long period of, of very slow development as, as Don said. I think I need to put my two cents in here too as well yes. from my perspective. Um, you need demand in order to have tall buildings. Uh, the urbanization process um, in New York uh, is continuous, uh, but it, uh, the economy is also interrupted by the Civil War and then additional issues as railroads begin to expand and wealth begins to uh, concentrate in financial services and a demand at uh, places like Wall Street in the financial district. Um, to have a business location near these centers of, of uh, capital. So having additional stories is only, uh, it, it, uh, is only attractive uh, if you have people who are willing to pay the rent uh, for the building, for the tower, the uh, stories that are, that are above. Um, so that you need technology in order to serve that end, but without the demand, without the economics, uh, and without the land value through the, the demand, um, there's simply not enough uh, demand to justify the multiplication of the value of land um, in the, in districts that become high-rise districts. Yeah, good, no, interesting. Um, next subject that interests me, um, having a very broad view of uh, construction history is what the implications uh, were of this uh, heavy activity on the industry itself. First, the, uh, the workers that put this up then become the iron workers. And this begins to trigger a lot of competition between the trades. So you can imagine the carpenters and the masons to some degree were pretty uh, aggravated by the fact that here was a new product that didn't need their services particularly. So where did those iron workers come from? Uh, Adan has commented, of course, that the, the ability of the engineers to grasp the basic concepts of statics uh, enabled the design to actually take place. And uh, who actually produced the, uh, the iron? I think we know, uh, we, we, we plenty of stories of, uh, of, um, of the Bethlehem steel and et cetera, et cetera. And as I understand it, the bulk of the actual construction contracts that were held to put the frame in place were from the, the steel manufacturers. Was that true? Uh, it's true early on. Um, so I, I, I like to point out in this discussion that my profession didn't exist until it was invented in the 1890s, which yeah. is to say there was no such thing as an, a structural engineer working on buildings whose career was on buildings before that because there was no need for it. Um, I, I think it's important to keep in mind, A, that the, the growth of steel framing was was a relatively small piece of the construction industry for a long time. So it's not like the first skeleton frames are built in 1890 and suddenly we need thousands and thousands of steel workers to put up these buildings because there simply, there weren't that many of them compared to the amount of construction as a whole. And the second thing is that it's not as if riveting was first used when skeleton frame buildings were built because people had been using pieces of steel framing in buildings before that. So there's sort of a steady growth of the need for steel fabrication and erection for buildings starting maybe in the 1860s or 1870s. And, and it, it grows and the growth accelerates after the skeleton frame building uh, starts, starts being built, but it's not a, a sudden thing. It's, a, it's an acceleration of a growth that already was there. It's, it's more of a type of labor that was already there. Yeah, and it, 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 pure speculation on my part, but I, I think that the the fact that Chicago was a center for uh, railroad production, that it that it made rails before it made uh, iron or, or steel buildings, probably meant that there was a, a, a labor force. It's not overly skilled labor, right? It's not. I wouldn't say that. Um, 
iron work or steel work was necessarily as skilled as uh, as bricklaying, but it was it was you, you certainly needed to know what you were doing, and that expertise probably came out of uh, the railroads and out of the fact that that bridges were prefabricated in Chicago, shipped out along with the labor to the end of the line where they were they were put together. So, my guess is that that's that's where the the labor came from in in Chicago and. Iron and steelwork, you know, like a lot of other uh, construction trades, was fueled by immigration, and it was certainly a kind of first and second generation uh, job for an awful lot of of the of the city uh, as it as it grew. And then there were the Huron uh, Indians, right? <laughs> Came down from Canada to do a lot of the uh, the high rise construction. Now, what are the other implications that came out of all this? was the, uh, the reinforcement of the use of general contracting. And there's an interesting story that, uh, that's related to, your, to your, uh, your comments earlier that the Tacoma building, which doesn't exist anymore, but that um, uh, created an interesting situation in that George Fuller, who went on to form a very famous, the largest American general contracting business for quite some time, uh, had been trained as an architect in Massachusetts and as a mason. And he came to Chicago after the Great Fire in the 1880, I think something like that, to pick up masonry work. And he was asked to put in a bid on the facade of the, the so-called semi-curtain wall of the Tacoma building. And the developers of this who, who were from Boston were aware that, uh, that he was interested in doing some work on the building. And they said, you know, you ought to get together with the, uh, the steel fabricator and uh, put together a joint proposal so that we have this coordination between the, the steel work and the, uh, the masonry uh, that is involved in the facade, which I think was probably terracotta, would it have been? I don't know. Anyway, yeah. um, Fuller, of course, from that point went on uh, to uh, very famously to uh, the other famous building that was originally called the Fuller Building. I think I'm right in calling it that, Don, and is now known as the, um, the Flatiron Building, still there in New York. And that was uh, that George Fuller built and for all I know could have developed. Otherwise, why would it be called the Fuller Building? Oh, it, it was built. It was built for Fuller for his company. The thing is, it was called the Flatiron Building even before it was complete. Um, <laughs> Fuller's rear guard action to not have it called that was lost cause. <laughs> okay. Any, any comments, Tom, about the general Yeah, contract? well, that, that, Fuller is another case where, you know, if you, when you want to point to a first, it's often hard to do, but Fuller is very clearly the first to take on the, the, both the title and the character of, of the general contractor. Uh, I, I think that it happens a little earlier even than the Tacoma, the Opera House, which was a Cobb and Frost building, uh, got a lot of press for the, for the fact that there wasn't an architect in charge of the construction, that it was Fuller uh, who was taking on all of the contracts. And the architectural community, of course, was outraged by this. You know, how are you ever going to Get a building built if you farm out the the responsibility of coordinating it to, to someone who's not you know in our in our guild. The, the Tacoma certainly makes sense as as uh, the the kind of next step. Uh, and you know Fuller went on to build you know like everything <laughs> in in Chicago and 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 New York. The 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 company books the the kind of advertising books that they put out are you know basically a, a who's who of of skyscraper construction in, in both cities. Well, he was he was really very clever as well because he invented uh, the cost plus contract, um, and the, yeah. the big the big plus of this was that um, they could actually start work before the designs were complete, because what Fuller would do, right. he, he said, "I'll give you a fee to pull it all together, general conditions and overheads and so on, and then uh, we'll bid out the sub trades and." Uh, is an estimate of what I think it will cost in total, but you know I can get to work tomorrow, and that was right. that. Of course, has been a continuous uh, development over the years and uh, right up until the present time. And it's a shame he went he went out of business in the sixties. <laughs>
I might add that Fuller also um, schooled the, uh, the Sterrett brothers, uh, which then turned into many branches of, uh, uh, of skyscraper builders uh, in New York and, and ac across America. But um, this issue that you're raising, uh, all of you are raising now, I think um, it is interesting to look at in the context of what um, Don has talked about in his book as a definition of modern, uh, modern structure. Modern structure, he says, embedded in one paragraph. I remember having saying, Don, why don't you pull this out as an idea? Modern structure is industrialized structure, if Don, I'm getting that right, yep. um, as, as a summary. And, and this is what we're, what we're talking about in the, uh, in the organization of the general contractor, as well as building trades, um, organizing the site, uh, supplying materials efficiently so that both um, materials themselves become industrialized as we saw in through many of your slides, but also the process of building becomes so much more efficient. It's like a factory in effect. So um, I'm not sure how that particular issue, which we haven't pulled out as one of the specific themes to highlight across the decades that we're looking at, but maybe in the context of, of frames, this is a good, uh, good opportunity to, to try to isolate that idea of the industrialized structure. Right, no, good comment. Um, one of the factors that very often teaches us some good lessons uh, resulting from a bad outcome are uh, collapses. Are there any stories of collapses of skyscrapers <laughs> or under construction? Uh, yes, but not well. In Chicago, they actually had a couple of steel frame buildings, not skyscrapers, but steel frame buildings come down. In New York, most of the collapses were related one way or another to cast iron. Uh, and that's what eventually got New Yorkers to give up on cast iron was the I, I don't, it's propensity to fail without warning. Um, but uh, it, it's a combination of collapses and fires that really drove people's thinking. Um, you know, it's, it, how, how do we not have what just happened happen again? <laughs> exactly, Joe. Yeah. Uh, I, I would, the, the Ireland uh, collapse in New York was the, incident that spurred the editorial in the yeah. engineering uh, magazine that said, you know, New York has got to get over it, its cast iron thing. I, I would actually, I'd point to two accidents that uh, prove the point in Chicago. Uh, instead of a collapse, the Owings building, uh, which is a great three act uh, opera on its own, um, experienced a, 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 a water tank being installed and the top floors uh, got dropped and punched through uh, all of the terracotta floors all the way down, um, but left the steel frame intact. And this was widely seen as kind of proof that, may, you know, maybe there was something to this, uh, this new material here, if the, the flooring is all destroyed and, and the frame is there. And this is more for our, our final discussion on, on fire, but the uh, Chicago Athletic Club, uh, another Cobb and Frost building, uh, burned uh, sh shortly before it was supposed to open in 1895. And the, the terracotta fireproofing successfully protected the steel. Um, they had a lot of cleanup to do, but the frame remained intact. And, and that was seen as sort of proof of concept that um, you know, steel framing maybe wasn't quite as dangerous as, as uh, the, the Bricklayers Union in particular uh, had been trying to make it out to be. Another example was uh, the, the, there was a Chicago style fire in Baltimore in 1902 uh, that really sort of leveled the center of the city. And uh, a number of the buildings that, that performed well were, were modern st steel frame buildings. And uh, one of them was a, a Burnham building and Burnham went to Baltimore, examined it himself and then wrote a, a report for the insurance company, you know, saying only these things are damaged and the building has performed beautifully. Uh, and there was a certain degree of um, self-promotion in that, but 
it was true that the modern fireproof buildings in Baltimore Center performed better in that fire than the older style buildings, uh, for, whatever, for whatever that's worth. A preview of coming attractions. Yeah. All right. Uh, and so now we are at um, the three hour mark of your um, continuing uh, conversation, uh, halfway through to the six hours that are that are planned. So I think for um, tonight, well, just by way of summary, I think uh, we could say that we've kind of undefined the frame while examining it uh, and probably demolished the idea of a, of a steel skeleton structure uh, as, uh, as a topic um, worthy of serious uh, attention uh, because everything is a hybrid. I'm not sure if we got that all quite right, but um, we do have a chance to come back in two weeks in order to, uh, to, to put the facade on the frame and to, um, to complicate um, the, uh, the discussion a, a little bit more while still keeping in mind how Chicago and New York diverged or develop in their, in their um, particular ways due to many conditions um, that nobody knows more about than uh, Don Friedman and Tom Leslie. So thank you both for the presentations again tonight. And thank you, Brian, for bringing your wisdom of, uh, of the decades um, to this discussion um, and your, your passion for construction history. So everybody, thanks for joining us uh, tonight. And we'll see you in two weeks um, as we look at facades. Good to see you all. Thanks. <laughs> Bye. Bye.